Welcome back. This is week 10 of our class on emotion and motivation. And we've got a really interesting uh, engagement with the reading. I'm somewhat not exactly angry, but indignant with the reading. I've noticed with academics in general, this book, Ekman's book that we're going to be discussing today and the academic readings, I will solely focus on the suppression of emotion, repression of emotion, awareness, impulse control. And again, they don't realize that that's part of the problem. When we suppress and repress emotions as a way to manage them, we're essentially lying to ourselves in a very important way. We're saying you don't exist, you shouldn't exist. <laughs> this is especially true of grief when someone has lost someone and everyone's saying, I know how just how you feel, or don't worry, or don't be sad. It's like they're basically all telling you to lie for their benefit and not to work through your grieving process and to learn to see even negative emotions as doorway to positive transformation and change and strengthening and deepening of the emotional body, of the emotional intelligence, and of your strength and character as a person. So my approach has been very, very different. It really has to do with learning into emotions. I will continue that. I'm going to be quite critical in this session on our readings when they talk about simply emotional uh, suppression. Uh, emotional repression would be continued or patterned suppression so that it becomes automatic, that you don't uh, aren't honest about your emotions. So um, that's one of the problems that I have. Uh, I don't really believe in that approach is a helpful approach. It may manage it if you are a really, really impulsive person and may do something very destructive, especially if you're a parent with a child who's frustrated with a child but it is not a long-term solution by any means. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of other things I wanted to, to talk about too, and I'm looking here on my notes. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the notion, <laughs> I mean, we're taught to lie about our emotions quite a bit as an adaptive measure. When you go to see an annoying aunt, and she treats you like a perpetual three-year-old. You're being told by your parents, go ahead and tolerate her, be nice to her, pretend you're happy. So there's so much here, not only in terms of suppressing emotions, but lying about them, expressing different emotions. And we're going to get into that into this session as well. Are not only considered to be okay in society, but sometimes even positively and commonly seen as good. So you don't hurt somebody else's feelings, you lie about their, your relationship with them. And finally, the third point I'm going to make in this is that we're now living in a selfie culture, Facebook and social media, in which people are creating an image that's a bit of a lie, very heavily edited understanding of their life, that makes it look as if everything is great and everything is happy. <laughs> and uh, if we don't learn into emotions, especially more unpleasant emotions, we get distracted into this fantasy world that has almost no relationship to the real world. You see this particularly um, with statements, for instance, by the um, president-elect Donald Trump, uh, now current president Donald Trump, when he says, I'm the least Semitic person you will ever know, or I'm the least racist person in one of his news conferences. Well, that can obviously <laughs> be demonstrated to be false, regardless of your, I mean, this, this happens also uh, on different sides of the aisle. I'm not going to be particular. I'm just using him as an actual uh, example because it's timely, but here's the issue. Um, we are getting fast getting to a time where we believe our own hype. So learning to detect through micro expressions, whether someone's lying with their emotions or lying to you are going to become, by the way, if you literally believe your own hype, your expressions, and even if you stick your finger in a lie detector test are going to make it look as if you're telling the truth because from your perspective, you are, you believe your own lie that becomes your truth. And there's no real thing within you to mitigate that. So I'm a much more in favor of, of exterior validation. For instance, evidence, does the evidence of your actions support what you believe about yourself? And even more than that relationship, that is at the tenor of your relationships, and opening up to those supportive of those claims that you're making. One of the things we're going, I'm going to ask you to do here, if you want extra credit points, and it's quite a few, it's about 20 points, 
is to read the Rosie Project. You can do it individually or as a group. Just do a little report. The reason why I've assigned this as a potential um, uh, extra credit is because the person in there is, is autistic, basically, a high-functioning autistic person. And emotions aren't really reflected through facial expressions. So she, this woman who is very arty and it's, it's, it's a comedy of manners because she's completely different, very expressive, extroverted, arty. And he's like this engineering kind of guy that is high functioning autistic, doesn't show his emotions. And it, it's really a comedy of manners of how those two come together. But what's really neat about this book is that it allows you to see how people begin to understand and develop true emotions through relationship even across very different personality and emotional profiles. So again, it's a way of getting learning into emotions instead of just looking at exterior indicators, suppressing them, repressing them, controlling, <laughs> limiting them. We're finding appropriate ways to develop into and to actually express them. So today we will look into the rest of the Ekman chapters. They're, all the academic reading is optional, so I'm not going to be taking care of that right now. I'm just going to do the Ekman chapters. But I really want you to think of those three things in mind. How, do we lie, how are we taught constantly in society to lie with our emotions, right? Um, is suppression and repression of emotion actually very healthy? Or is it itself a form of lie? You know, yes, it may be a necessary lie at one time if our explosion is going to really hurt someone else. But as a long-term thing, is it healthy? And thirdly, in the selfie culture, in a virtual world driven culture, uh, does it really make sense to think about lying in the ways that we used to? Because people more and more begin to believe their own images they created for themselves. <laughs> and is there a better, more healthy way for us to look at how we create our emotions in ways that are in tune with evidence and that point to healthy relationships? So here we go. Um, let's jump on into the readings. Uh, this is chapter nine, Enjoyable Emotions. Again, great picture. You see joy here. Um, now, he, uh, Ekman doesn't really consider joy an emotion because it encompasses too many different kinds of pleasurable emotions. Same with happiness, okay? Um, what I found really interesting on this first page here, um, and I think I'll just move this over a tad so we make sure we get this, is, um, uh, you know, well, he talked about joy and happiness over here, but here, look at this. This is a really interesting thing because it really shows you where a lot of the research on emotions have gone. We don't know much about most of the enjoyable emotions yet for nearly all emotional research, including mine, has focused instead on the upsetting emotions. Attention has been focused on emotions when they cause problems to others and ourselves. As a result, we know more about mental disorder than about mental health. That is changing now as there is new emphasis on what is called positive emotions and positive psychology. And I believe we can greatly benefit by knowing and understanding more about enjoyable emotions. Really? <laughs> you know what I mean? The good life isn't just about avoiding unpleasant emotions. It might actually be delving into positive emotions. Thank you for that blazingly, you know, amazingly uh, precise insight there. So anyway, he goes through the different kinds of emotions. He first he goes into what he calls sensory pleasures up here, and he actually calls them emotions. I tend to disagree with him on that. They don't involve a lot of mediation. Certain things generally, in, in terms of educational uh, evolutionary psychology, tend to help uh, draw us in a particular direction. But we can say, okay, there are five different ones. There are pleasant smells, pleasant tastes that automatically tend to generate states of mind and states of heart that are pleasurable or enjoyable. He goes on to name some others like amusement, right? Entertainment, uh, contentment, right? Um, excitement arising in response to novelty or challenge contentment, a relaxation of the facial muscles, you know, and, and just <sighs> relief, similar to contentment, but probably more short term when you have had some kind of stress and now that stress has been taken off. Um, wonder. Now, he used to use awe in here, and in some of the academic regions, they used awe, but because that word connoted dread and fear to a certain extent, wonder doesn't have that. Wonder is a purely like, wow, kind of emotion. Um, so he even uses an example here, 
where he had these all these life coincidences with somebody he he, he happened to meet a professor of theater from new york university there and it just there were so many coincidences he had such a sense of wonder about how all these things happened together um uh, no one knows as yet if there is a distinctive signal in face, voice, or body movement for wonderment. <laughs> Again, we're seeing the problems with uh, using quantitative measures for qualitative experiences. Uh, and again, I don't see that as being that helpful to something especially like wonderment. Ecstasy or bliss, a state of self-transcendent rapture achieved some through meditation, others experiences in nature, even sexual experiences. That's another one of the uh, enjoyable emotions he refers to. Um, now this uh, motion, uh, Isabella uh, Poggi describes an emotion called Fiero, which he lists as one of his enjoyable emotions. It's, a, um, it's basically that feeling you get. It's not just pride, but this kind of, ah, yes, I, you get when you, uh, solve, you know, a difficult problem. You find a solution to a difficult problem. Some of you may have experienced that in this class when you tried some of the experiments and you really got a positive result. Um, and there isn't any necessarily any audience for that. Another one, a, a Yiddish word in this game is called natchez, is the uh, specific word uh, as the glow of pleasure plus pride that only a child can give to his parents <laughs> or his or her parents. So, uh, so we can go through that, um, and you know, he's just defining these emotions. So I'm just going through them very quickly. Uh, we have talked about elevation, right? Uh, the feeling that people experience when they see unexpected acts of human goodness, kindness, and compassion, including by the person themselves. Uh, gratitude, that's one of the emotions we've described, is appreciation for an altruistic gift that provides benefit. Um, again, uh, and then schadenfreude, it's a German term. We got now three different, like four languages if you include English, but basically that is uh, kind of a certain kind of joy or giddiness you get it when someone who's been a real jerk to you gets their comeuppance, okay? <laughs> when a rival gets, you know, kind of, kind of the, uh, the, the, the results or the consequences of their, their actions. So there are, he's talking about 16 enjoyable emotions. He, he goes ahead and lists them here as the five sensory pleasures, amusement, contentment, excitement, relief, wonderment, ecstasy, fiero, natchez, elevation, gratitude, and schadenfreude. And, uh, and again, he, he asks if they all qualify as distinct emotions. Um, okay, he's categorized them and we've gone ahead and summarized them. Now let's get into a bit of a discussion about what these mean, okay? One thing I notice about enjoyable emotions, uh, again, and this is on page uh, 200, 201, I made this notation, is they involve a loving relationship and an enjoyment or an embrace of life. There's something about life energy and loving relationships that really tend to evoke these sense of enjoyable emotions and they're oftentimes implicated. These two things, love of life and a loving relationship in cultivating and evoking positive feelings. So being in the presence of a loved one, right? Parental love, the birth of a wanted child um, is oftentimes among the happiest events that anyone can experience. Um, so we keep going. Uh, joy, happiness, we talked a little bit about that. I'm not gonna keep continue to go on it. Here again is the issue that I talked about, okay? Uh, fake smiles or, or masking, right? Here is Ronald Reagan kind of a grin and bear it smile. This woman was the NAACP. She said the NAACP does not necessarily subscribe to the views that are about to be expressed by Ronald Reagan. And some of his policies were not friendly to the African-American community. So he kind of made it look like he was smiling, but he's also kind of grimacing here. Okay, again, here's where we're using an emotional expression to mask a true emotion inside it. This is what he calls a grin and bear it smile. Um, and this is also managing emotion with a smile. Here's Nixon over here. You can tell he's not really happy, but he's trying to put on a happy face. This is during his impeachment proceedings and so forth. And he's doing it sometimes trying to force that through facial muscles to manage, like it says here, his regret and likely despair. So 
Another name for this is miserable smiles. <laughs> it typically occur, and again, they're forced. We call them fake smiles oftentimes. They're, mm, yes, mm -hmm. like the golf pad. <laughs> you know, you know, kiss, kiss, you know. It's either a pleasantry, or there's no real love loss there. So again, the issue here again is that we have been taught largely to mask not only our own negative emotions, but our negative emotions, in the case of Nixon here, his own negative emotions. But here in Reagan, he's one wants the grandpa image to be maintained here. The kind of the grandpa image is not maintained if you get angry at someone and show it outwardly. So he's he's trying to trying to can contain himself in this instance. Um, again, many people accused Hillary Clinton of that too, of using a lot of fake to get beyond the political left and right here, fake imagery or competence or smiles uh, on cue uh, to get a sense of warmth because she had had a reputation of not being terribly a warm person or not coming off as a warm person and wanting to do that through the conscious cultivation of smiling and so forth. So it's not limited to one particular political party. It's certainly not limited to one cultural group and so forth. These are problems we all deal with across the board. And the main issue, I think personally, is to begin to express our emotions more clearly, more cleanly, and more in a more healthy way, and in a, certainly a more authentic way. If we're displeased with something, we shouldn't be forced to say we like it. We can simply say, I accept it, or I'm glad you like it. <laughs> we don't have to pretend it's for us, I think. Okay. And it says, we're human beings Again, this is on the first page of lies and emotions, okay? It says, we're human beings capable of deliberately suppressing from view any signs of their true feelings, especially when those emotions were felt very intensely. Is there any true way to see the emotion beneath a false mask? So he goes through here and beginning to talk about that. And one of our main objectives, again, for this, uh, for this week is to see how lying and deception mask emotions and perpetuate certain injustices or certain false relationships. And there's plenty a lot, okay? Um, uh, let me see what it says here. Okay, we go down here where it says micro expressions. What they found was that even people who try to suppress it, usually there's a moment, a real quick moment, like a 12th of a second or a sixth of a second in which the person's true emotions came out and then they went into the other mode. This was true of someone trying to commit suicide and pretending she was okay, trying to get out and then she was gonna commit suicide. She was obviously not okay. He calls these micro expressions and this nonverbal leakage about a person's true feelings. You can kind of put, pick up on that. Um, but like I say down here, we are often taught to give people what they want to hear. And we're so trained in that way that even when it comes to something as dramatic as suicide, we fall into that mode to just reflect and mirror what that other person wants to hear so we can get out and do what we want to do. Again, what would happen if from day one as children, we are, are taught to talk out our emotions, to express them and to have them received, even if they're unpleasant and to talk and learn into them. Very different world would uh, come out, I suspect. And um, again, signs of repressed emotion, not deliberately suppressed emotions. Okay, so oftentimes when we have enough of a pattern of suppressing emotions, it becomes unconscious and literally we can't access that. I say that personally as someone who became so good at controlling his emotions that I actually got scared. My lowest emotional point was when I was in this long distance relationship in my late 20s with a woman in Boston. And I literally tried to reach in and feel my feelings and I couldn't even access them. I had become so good at suppressing and controlling them. I couldn't access my own feelings. In fact, it felt good when I was doing my rollerblades. This is when rollerblades were first out. And I went down a hill and I carved the curve so dramatically that my, my wheels slipped out and I just scraped up my entire side. But there was something thrilling I'm not a masochist, but there was something thrilling about being able to feel the pain, physical pain of that crash. And so it really woke me up. I began to say, listen, there is a real problem here. You are so good at managing and controlling your emotions and putting on either a veneer of competence or just moving bad emotions to the side and bullying your way through that it's time for you to begin to open up and look into them. 
In fact, I think that experience has been one of the things that have driven me to really become interested in emotion and motivation. So, so here I am trying to pass it on some of this knowledge, but I don't come from this place in which I've been always expressive. I've come from a place in which I have tried on the suppressing, repressing, controlling, managing, and simply being mentally aware of emotions, and it simply doesn't work very well. Hasn't for me, and I don't think from my experience that it works for many other people. So let's go ahead and keep on going down here. Um, okay, it talks about behavioral cues, okay? Not all behavioral cues to deceit are emotional. Again, this gets to the evidence of uh, the, the, the importance of evidence, okay? Because if a person believes their own deceit, then really there's not going to be any cues there. But say their actions or words are contradictory, okay? Then you can say, wait a minute. <laughs> or there's changes in their behavior, or there is hesitation, okay? Where even if they believe their own hype, usually it takes a little while for the brain to move into that new space that they've created for themselves. So there's hesitation there. So these can be signs uh, independent of a person's own view uh, uh, <clears throat> to get uh, to understand if someone is not quite on the up and up when it comes to their expression, authenticity. I think I've already talked about this, right? Um, when we're in a world where people believe their own, basically their own hype, uh, we're basically left with evidence and relationship as the gauges for whether or not that is, whether or not it's true or false, whether it's healthy or un unhealthy. Generally speaking, we don't think that falseness is healthy, <laughs> but yet we've been taught that it is. We've been saying, listen, if you just go ahead and keep a brave face on, it's gonna be okay, you know? Um, if you go ahead and just fake it till you make it, right? And there's some truth to that, especially with small things, and especially when it comes to not getting too down on yourself. But if it replaces the active learning into and, and sometimes difficult building up from, uh, say, failure, um, then what's going to happen is you're going to go in a circle, continue to go into a circle. So here's the conclusion, living with emotion. <clears throat> um, I haven't seen much on that. Um, on tip page 232, oh, no, 234, they have a great summary. All these bullet points are all this is the summary of all the attributes or parameters for what this person believes is an emotion and what academic research in general <clears throat> believes is an emotion. So you can read through that. What's very interesting at the, at the bottom of this list, which really is apropos for this week because we're dealing with guilt, shame, and embarrassment is this statement. Before closing, I'd like to say a little bit more about guilt, shame, and embarrassment. These emotions do not have unique facial expressions. Guilt and shame are hard to distinguish from sadness, except for the possibility that the head may be turned away. The failure to have distinctive signal for guilt and shame, however, makes sense, since when feeling these emotions, a person does not want others to know how he or she feels, and so perhaps the signal did not evolve. Again, he's kind of showing that there isn't everything can be done by reading the face, but I can tell you this, by creating an open and nurturing environment where the person who is shameful can learn into their gift, be able to share their emotion and the root of it. This is especially important and true in abuse, especially childhood abuse. Um, and then create an environment in which their deep longings and passions and talents are, um, are nurtured and given some sway or power to act themselves out in the world, we'd have a much different world. The shame goes away and replaced by the positive and transformed into the positive emotion of empowerment. So that is where we're really trying to go this week. Um, when we talk about the ovarian psychos, which is a film I want you to see, and I'm gonna put in a few clips, okay, that's actually debuting on PBS on Monday night, and it should be on their uh, website, at least for another week. Usually they have it on for an entire week when they have a debut film. So much of what's happened is there's this shame, guilt, and it's kept inside, it's kept in the community, it's hidden. And these women are becoming more public, they're finding positive risk, humorous, and also creative ways 
to deal with these things in a way that is affirmative. It's not just slamming someone else down or coming out against maybe men who are sexist in their community, but finding a way to have a positive presence so that they can be themselves authentically, speak about their issues, and take a more empathetic approach with people and men, for instance, in their lives who may have perpetuated abuse or been taught how to be sexist to women. So it's a very inspiring story. And uh, it really takes on this notion of shame and guilt and shows how it can be transformed. So I'm really looking forward to all of us beginning to watch that. Again, here we look at impulse awareness and emotional behavior awareness. Now in this class, we are doing a lot of emotional behavior awareness. Um, the, uh, when, when we're talking about conflict, when we're talking about doing a hard stop or a timeout, and then we're talking about resetting the situation. What we're doing is we're catching ourselves in a pattern. A lot of you in your conflict with someone else have a pattern of relating which is negative or not helpful. Uh, a lot of it has to do because you come with different orientations. One's an extrovert and the other one's an introvert. The other one needs time to think about it. The other one wants to solve it immediately, <laughs> you know? And there is no mediating place for the two of you to be able to work it out We have a conversation and talk about what works for best of you both of you. When we went through that conflict exercise, I am amazed by some of the things that have come up. In fact, I have still to do some of the Ask Dr. Zeus sharing with that. But again, that was contingent on behavioral awareness and impulse awareness, but that awareness did not result in suppression. It resulted in conversation and introspection and sharing between people. That you won't normally see in academic texts. You know, I guess they expect that is to be for the life coaches or whatever, <laughs> but not uh, not for their specific quantitative um, uh, endeavor. So uh, this has been I, a, an amazing experience for me. This concludes more or less the six emotional classes that we have been looking through. So each group now has a basis and a week devoted to working through this particular emotion having a conversation about it and trying to transform these so-called negative emotions into positive emotions. So again, this week, no academic readings. I'm leaving them up there. If you want to read about regulation, you have your, you are very welcome. But I think we've taught that far too much. And what we really need is creative expression and relationship engagement so that we learn how to develop healthy interchange of emotions and a healthy expression of emotions. So until we meet again, this is Zeus with this week's reading. We'll see you and thanks a lot. Bye.